Well, good evening and welcome to another edition of Co-Creating the New Earth Together. Uh, today I'm here with Neil de Strother. I don't know whether it's fair to call you a world famous author, but I think you're... Uh, <laughs> well, right. let's do it in the hope that that uh, becomes the truth. Yes. yes. I think you're pretty well known. Um, Neil has worked as a journalist for 20 years and a journey practitioner for 17. And we're going to be talking more about that later. He has a master's degree in journalism and a dip psych. He's also worked in the past as a podcast host, interviewing spiritual illuminaries, including Bishop Desmond Tutu. And I really want to talk about that later on. Uh, as well. yeah, yeah. Uh, in addition, Neil has some in-depth experience of shamanism, including taking part uh, with ceremonies with the Bushmen of Botswana. Yeah, that's true. Neil is the author of several inspirational novels, the most famous of which, A Flower in the Desert, has been translated into several languages. Yes. Uh, you'll find a full list uh, of Neil's books in the description on the YouTube version of this, uh, of this um, show, which will be posted uh, directly after we finish recording. Uh, more recently, Neil has set up an online Facebook group, Alternative Hastings and St. Leonard's, and hosted events for the 1,500 plus members with an aim to encourage a close knit, like minded community in the area. Yep. Welcome, Neil. Well, thank you. Nice to be here. Tell me, did you go straight into uh, journalism from university? No, no, no. I um, I went through various uh, sort of iterations <laughs> of, uh, of of work. I, I mean, it's probably too many to mention. Well, definitely too much, many to mention. But I mean, one of them was I was for a while I was a headhunter in the sort of eighties time when uh, you know it was the uh, sort of yuppie type thing. Although I'd probably never quite constituted a yuppie. <laughs> and then uh, then I had worked abroad for a while doing sort of, um, I lived in France for a while, doing some sort of more like market type work there. I set up a little business with jewelry and stuff. And so it's all these sort of little lines and, and whatever. And then I became, then I got involved in journalism. Yeah, I've been, um, I've had a similar life story, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, I never really settled to anything. It's not a classic, uh, you know, a career path, let's put it that way. Um, I mean, my first book, Rupert Murdoch's Hitmen, was an expose of the mainstream media. Right. So I'd be particularly interested to hear any experiences you had at that time that maybe woke you up a bit or uh, made you start to think. Well, writing for, you know, journalism. Yeah. I mean, mo mostly I worked in-house, to be honest. I did a lot of work. I mean, I got first-hand experience of... Um, working alongside but not for um, various um, education departments at the time because I, I wrote about education for, um, for for consultancies and that was very insightful about the machinations of, of, of the way that it works because it's an incredibly um, structured and controlled and um, sort of environment and very much tiered as to what level you are and to you know, I was I was shocked by it actually. Mm. Although they're not they're not the worst part of government, I don't think. But nonetheless, they, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm glad they're there. Really. Mm. Well, I I had the uh, interesting uh, experience of meeting uh, a News of the World uh, journalist. Okay. Uh, which is a different side of it altogether, of course. That's the gutter yeah. press. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he told me all the stories that they made up in the pub and uh, th things that, I mean, although I'd never been a News of the World reader, um, uh, stories that I think people just accepted as true at the time, yeah. which turned out to be complete fabrications. I think it's, it's shocking. And um, yeah, I mean, I never, I mean, I, the opportunities I had to get into the, the, the mainstream sort of uh, written media like that, I. To be honest, I just didn't have the heart for it because it is. Yeah. There's so much 
bullshit and so much being forced to write you know things that you don't believe in and I just never felt comfortable with that as a as an as a as a way of being it's I mean I still don't feel comfortable with that I don't like to you know be untrue to myself really no it shot me to the core um because he's particularly talking about Murdoch obviously in the Murdoch press because that was his personal experience um and, and Murdoch was trying to curry favor with Thatcher at the time yeah uh, so they were making up all these stories uh, to support Thatcher's um, uh, attack on the unions. Yeah. Well, of course, we're lucky because it doesn't happen anymore, does it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we can completely trust in the base yeah, of the right. now, can't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the experience of the last two years, I think... Oh, people who just... people weren't <laughs> woken up by that will never, ever be woken no, up. Um, but, I mean, some people aren't, but it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, how we still are conditioned to believe what we read. And even when we know it's not true, there's a temptation. There's something that, you know, this is how populism works, isn't it? There's something that, that you can't quite, is a nagging sort of doubt, even though you know it's bollocks. You know, it's yeah. just this, it's that, it's, and that's, a, that's the corrosiveness of it, I think. Well, it can't be true, it would have been in the papers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And yet there's still plenty of people who are, you know, will just feed, you know, will just go along with the mainstream narrative, and uh, which sometimes can be true, of course. I mean, it's not like it's always not true, but, you know, it's, it's being controlled most of the time. I think there's always a slant on it, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's you different know. ways of portraying any particular fact. Yeah, and because of the, the, the way it's spun, mm. people get skewed ideas of, of reality. Well, I think that's what we, or I've become, and I'm sure many other people have become aware of, is that the, um, you know, it is who controls the narrative. I mean, it really is about narrative. And if you watch, I mean, I've worked in PR in my time, for example, and I've done, you know, marketing and all that sort of stuff. And what you know, what I know more and more is he's got a, somebody grabs the narrative up front. Of course, the, the written media are, very, you know, to largely owned by people who, who want a right wing agenda. So that sort of adds, um, you know, far more weight to, to the uh, to the narrative. And before you know it, people are just not even thinking outside that narrative. The narrative is the only thing, yeah. you know, and, and then we, then the context for our conversations is ludic ludicrously skewed. Um, and we're left, you know, some of us are left absolutely like, you know, what the fuck? I don't know what we're <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm that. Speak, 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 speak your mind. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you know what I mean. WTH. WTF, yeah. I should say. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. 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 So, you, how did you get into this journeying? And yeah. The, the journey uh, practitioner stuff. Yeah. That, well, I mean, it's a, it's a long story and a short one, and I'll keep it relatively brief, but I suppose, you know, I, I come, like a lot of us, from quite a, quite a um, unsettled background. I, my mother died when I was relatively young, mm. um, and I did various therapies to try and work out, you know, and get to some sort of point of well-being, um, and, well, more than well-being, you want, you want to live in a very full way, don't you, in this, in this every life, like everyone else. Yeah. And uh, I did all these things. I did, uh, you know, talking therapies, the usual sort of counselling type things. I did art therapy. Um, I mean, I've done quite a few, loads of workshops, and I got quite, quite big time into shamanism. Um, I mean, I, I would not consider myself, um, you know, practitioner on that front at all but I did quite a lot of work with that um, and then I just the thing that really got I just went to a talk at alternatives in London ages ago if you know if you know that's like for sort oh, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, I slightly veer away from the word spiritual but it's for for sort of spiritual speakers and uh, Brandon Bayes who runs this journey thing was talking I Weirdly, I mean, I wasn't particularly taken or whatever, but, you know, like in those days, I used to buy the book quite often, bought the book, read the book, just thought I'll go. And then I found it just happened to be a process that went straight into the um, emotional, you know, and that's that's what I needed. I didn't need to 
to talk about it. I didn't need to, uh, you know, theorize about it. I just needed to feel, and, th and that's what it allowed. Yeah, I mean, you pulled me up because on the flyer I put uh, shamanic journey. Yeah. And you're not doing that. No, uh, I've done done plenty of it myself, but mm. I don't facilitate it. Um, so these journeys are, are they path workings, uh, guided visualizations? Is that what you mean? Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's very. I mean, I would say, even though it's not the same thing, it has quite a lot of parallels with hypnosis. You're not really. You're not in trance, but you're in a sort of um, deep, relaxed state. And then instead, the, I, the essentially what you're, what I am hoping to facilitate with a client, is for them to 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 go beyond mind, you know, and to go into the body. Um, knowing the knowledge of the body, um, what's held in the body, you know, we hold these traumas in parts of our body or, you know, and, and, and really to release that. So it's, it's a way um, to go very directly into something. I mean, talking therapy, which I, you know, all of them have their, their pluses, but I spent probably, I don't know, two or three years or something doing that. And I would say that I talked around the subject from my point of view, but never just dive straight in the middle and thought, you know, what in the messy, you know, I mean, the healing's in the messy, shadowy yeah. darkness, not in the, not in the like, oh, I can work this out like a detective novel. And uh, so with the journey, it, it really helped me to do that. You know, it's a tool to do that. So does that tie in with shadow work? Um, I mean, it doesn't explicitly, but I mean, you are going into shadow stuff. You're going into the unconscious. You know, mm -hmm. you're going, you're going into stuff that's being held. And so often, as as, as you must know, you know, it's something so. Um, you know, it could be an enormous event in someone's life. You know, sexual abuse or death or whatever it is, and yet sometimes the thing is being held in something that almost seems an irrelevance to that. Some tiny little part of that, like you know, I don't know, being. The, the bit that they hold or the bit they can't let go of might be just that moment being locked into a room or whatever it, I don't I don't know I can't but you know what I mean it's like sometimes with these huge events people are aware of them and yet the actual thing that's blocking can be quite small and we're often mm. really not aware of that what was it that Jung said um until you make the unconscious conscious it will continue to control your life and you will call it fate Yes, well, that's yes, um, and of course, it's a never-ending uh, challenge, isn't it, to make the unconscious? So there's a lot. There's a lot about how do you make that? How do you live present in the present as well, rather than always future pacing to like I'm trying to get somewhere. It's like I'm here already, but let's enjoy it. The exploration. Hmm. So let's segue into talking a little bit about shamanism and uh, the, the um, experiences you had in Botswana. Yes, that was amazing. Um, well, I trained, trained and did lots of stuff with Jonathan Horitz, who does the Scandinavian School of Shamanism. It's a very um, beautiful approach, I think. Not, um, I mean, I know a lot of, lot of stuff now is around ayahuasca and all the rest of it, but that was not the, the path I took. Um, but it's a very sort of uh, beautifully connected way of being anyway, just as a background. Then we went, then not with him actually, I went with a group that went out to work doing shamanic stuff with the Bushmen. Well, I say with, <laughs> it was like, it was like sort of um, utter, I mean, it was, it was embarrassing in a way because you're going there, you know, thinking, well, I know a little bit about this. And then you go and meet 20,000 years worth of shamanic practice in its yeah. naked, uh, environment yeah. so really I just felt like I felt ludicrously unequipped for the for the depth of the work that was going on but it was astonishing yeah it was amazing I mean these could have been there could have been sitting there literally well, I, don't, I say 20,000 years I don't know exactly but let's say 10,000 years ago and it would have been the same looking people in the same sort of clothes when they take their shamanic work clothes you know and they're doing the same boiling energy they're doing all of this stuff under a Kalahari uh, night, you know, the stars vivid, mm -hmm. uh, the warmth, and just this extraordinary, you know, you're transported out of, out of the world, really, into, into a whole different place. It must have been an incredible experience. Yeah, fantastic. What did, what did you get out of it personally? Um, humility, 
think. I think it was just, I mean, there was something just beautiful about it. I think I, it, re it was really touching, you know, to, to connect with these people. Um, I felt, yeah, I felt a little bit, I mean, I, when I say humility, I, I almost mean that. I wasn't going with any arrogance. I never felt I was a particularly powerful a shamanic work, but I really realized that, you you know, we can, we can dress up looking, try and make ourselves look like we're really cool and sort of shamanic, you know, and we can do all the stuff and we can talk the stuff and we can do all that, but the real core depth of it, whoa, that's, that's, some people I'm sure have it, but it was, it was like, it was a real opening into this is real, you know, this is truly um, anchored in, in, in a real tradition. So yeah, I guess, I guess I realized that. And I, and I just felt, you know, and I also realized, which we all realize how much has been lost in our society, mm -hmm. you know, because you feel that connection. I mean, they've been persecuted, the Bushmen, uh, and still are persecuted terribly as we persecute just about every indigenous population. Yes. Um, and of course, there's this endless thing that their wisdom is what we need and it's become a cliche really. And in a sense, it's, 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 it's their wisdom, but it's not just their wisdom. It's this wisdom translated into, a, into our environment. You know, it's, uh, you know, because it's fairly obvious, some of it. I mean, we should be honoring nature. You know, we should have a spiritual connection. We should move away from just a materialist way of being. You know, it's not rocket science, is it? If we all respected Mother Earth as a goddess, we couldn't do the things that we currently do. It would be we would be incapable of doing uh, the terrible things that we currently do to her. I, if yeah, we held her in that reverence. I don't... Yes, I don't. I mean, obviously, there are people who have a, have a heart connection to the goddess Earth, or however you want to put it. And yes, there's no way people can feel comfortable when they've opened to that in in just destroying what what gives us life. I mean, it's just insane, and we all know it's insane. Well, I, I say we all do. Anyone who's got you know any opening to this sort of this sort of way of being, yes, knows that. If, if we go to her respectfully, she gives us everything we need. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, we've we've got ourselves into a hell of a pickle, though, haven't we? I mean, the, I, I, I mean, there are so many debates about it, but we're we're in my view, and I don't know what on earth we do about it, but the population we have isn't really sustainable if we're going to keep nature wild. How do we? How do we? You know, we, we're very human centric. I mean, I don't, I'm certainly not into, you know, destroying humanity at all. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. You know, I would hope there is an answer that is benign. But the the reality is we need the wild areas. We need to respect the, 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 the wild animals and the, and the fauna and flora and all the rest of it in the same to the same degree as we respect each other. And it tends to be human centric the way we see the world. It's all about saving us, really save the world. I mean, that you know, the world, as we know, is okay. We're not saving the world, is the truth. There are, you know, there are, there are extinctions every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, and, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I just think, you know, it's, 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 we do need to undo a lot, of the, a lot of the wrongs that we've done. I think it's an attitude problem, isn't it, really? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we're not saying anything, different to anyone else really to say that we've become disconnected haven't we we've just be, we've lost our connection not only to the, the world outside but the world inside you know and, I, and i'm not not even coming from a position of arrogance on this you know i can see where i've you know the disconnects and things and you're sort of working to to, to keep them alive or to make them alive or to reconnect you know that's I mean, that's, sorry no i think that's part of our life's purpose isn't it to to sort of live in that, um, well, I can't remember what the word is, but live in that way anyway. Yeah. I mean, back in the 60s, I was banging the drum about um, controlling the population um, just through birth control. Yeah. Just through common sense. Yeah. 
um, just through not replacing ourselves with more people than we're replacing that, that are going out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I said then, back in the 60s, it shows how old I am, um, that we can do it the easy way or the hard way. Yeah. We can um, take responsibility now or 50, 60, 70 years down the line, Mother Nature, Mother Earth will have us off her back. Yeah. And uh, a lot of uh, water's got under the bridge since then. And, and I think now it's possibly too late to um, start acting responsibly. I think no, I mean, I mean, people, are talking, sorry, people are talking about like deep adaptation, aren't they? You know, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, these things are happening. How do we adapt to it? It's not really how do we stop it? Um, I, for myself, I feel the, the focus um, of a lot of the um, work against these things has been a bit too much climate orientated. Oh, um, absolutely. Not absolutely. enough based on, on things we can actually do, such as, such as save a forest, you know, like the Amazon. You know, if we really, I mean, we, let's face it, if the world war had the will, that would not be difficult to stop the logging there. Um, you know, there's complications, but it could happen. It's, it's the seas. We don't have to pump shed loads of whatever we pump into it. We don't have to pump it into the rivers. These things are stoppable and quite doable and also doable at a local and an international level. Whereas a more um, sort of amorphous, keeping something at an abstract level, I, I feel we're being, you know, we're, in a way we're being saying, you know, it's the dog whistle thing, isn't it? Let's, they, if they all look over there, then we we'll just get on with doing what we're doing anyway. You know, and that um, it, it means that things just don't happen. You know, the COP26 or whatever, you know, all the stuff's spoken and then doodle squat happens, doesn't it? You know, it's like. Yeah. I mean, we could replace an awful lot of our tree usage um, if we went over to using hemp. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it's like, renewable every year. Yeah. And it's, well, it's full of the money with all these things, isn't it, really? You know, you know, we're not. Um, it's, 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 I mean, this is where this sort of community thing comes in, isn't it? If you get, you know, because the more people you get who at least are rallying around something that um, um, has, I mean, I say heart led, but I think that's a bit of a cliche too, but, you know, has feeling for the, for these things, for the world, the better. But not everybody who is involved in that, me included, is greatly enlightened. You know, we're all fallible. So we have to somehow work together to um, to at least start creating a better world, which is your thing, I know. Um, and 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 that's going to, you know, there's going to be plenty of hiccups along the way, and we're going to cock it up, and you know, each one of us is imperfect, but at least we have a vision that is for something, you know, that 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 is far more far more um, beautiful or sensible than we have now. I mean, agriculture, or Halter horticulture. Um, we need to get back to feeding the soil, not just feeding the plants. I absolutely. I, I mean, I when I read these things, and I try to limit how much I read, but you hear about what's happening to the soil around the world. I mean, you just think, Jesus, what are we doing? And yeah. we're all st we're, we're all starving. Yeah. We're all on supplements because we can't get the, the, everything we need from our food. Yeah. How crazy is that? I know, and also it's you know. Things like, uh, well, you know, we, yeah, hey, we could go on forever about it because it's, it's just, it's extraordinary, isn't it? It's all topsy-turvy. It all needs to turn around, you know, and, it, and, it, and if there was a will, a real political will, and it's, and, you know, a bottom-up movement and political will, it would happen. Yeah, absolutely. How do we actually get people to embrace that? Well, I think it's really difficult, isn't it? Because to some extent, the the minutiae of it, um, I mean, a, sort of in inverted commas, is quite dull. You know, it's not for everybody to go into the sort of like, um, you, you know, I, 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 I find quite a lot of it a bit boring. So there's got to be people who like to do that. We need to make it so that for some of us who are less sort of into the detail, we can at least join it 
if it, you know, if for example, there was a shop that, that sold only well, you know, well sourced goods and I don't know, and whatever, what have you. And, and price is of course an issue, isn't it? You know, that's an, an, a bigger and bigger issue. But if there was, so, you know, if there was something like that, when let's say Sainsbury's decided overnight, they were not going to have any packaging, I would go there. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, that's not, I mean, it, I can see there are issues around it, but I can't, I can't really see it's undoable. Yeah. I mean, as you were saying earlier, uh, the majority, a large percentage uh, of the people who are environmentally minded have been misled and, and, and taken down this climate change. I think so. Um, I mean, isn't it, for me, it's an issue. I, I'm not, I mean, I, I have friends who don't feel it is, but I feel it is, but I just don't think it's something, it's too big. Yeah. I did, I, I, I started to question climate change when I was at university. Mm. Um, I did environmental science. Right. And we just had a, a lecture on, uh, on, on well, what, what was it called? Global warming of those yeah. days. Um, and I wasn't convinced, to be honest. I mean, I, re I really, really respected the, uh, the professor that was um, lecturing us. A brilliant guy, a guy called Ewan McPhee at um, Greenwich University. And uh, so I, I was sort of half believing it because he believed it. Right. And I respected him. Yes. It didn't make any sense. Yeah. And then there were a few of us um, later on in the day. Uh, just having a drink in the bar, just a, just a, a handful of the inner circle, if you like. Right, okay, yeah. And Ewan walked in and he just said, look, I'm sorry, I have to teach this stuff or I'd lose my job, but I don't believe it either. Wow, okay, that's interesting. And that really woke me up. Not the fact yeah. that he didn't believe it either, that wasn't really the point. It was the point that the science was so weak right. that they had to threaten people and censor people to prop it up. Yes. Well, I mean, I have been, you know, having these conversations. Um, I think where I come from is that, that in a way, in, a, in one sense, anyway, it doesn't matter because the point we should be working for, you know, it's, I think um, Caroline Lucas said or something, you know, so we stop emissions and pollution and X, Y, and Z, you know, ultimately it's not a bad thing, is it? So it's, uh, oh, you know, absolutely. It's it's really, but I as I said earlier, I think our focus is wrong to be on it because it is there is there is it is open to question and it's too big a thing. You know you can't. You, you, I think you know anyone who in who doesn't want anything to happen would be delighted that everyone's focusing on that because you know how are we going to get the whole globe to suddenly stop, you know emissions and everything overnight? It's just not going to happen. Well, maybe it will happen. I don't know, but I, I find it hard to believe. There's lots of things we can control. And there's lots of things we are controlling. But the more people are taken down this climate change route and their focus is taken off the other things. Yeah, that's the problem. That's, that's what's worrying me. Um, and anyway, how can we grow enough crops for an increasing population without a rise in CO2. And CO2, yeah. the crops need the CO2. Yes, well, yes, I, again, as I say, I've had all these conversations. I'm, I'm, jury's out for me. I'm still a little bit, you know, believing, but it, my feeling is either way, it, as I say, just to repeat myself, really, I don't think it really matters because I think we should be focusing on other things yeah, we yeah, that yeah. we can deal with. You know, this to me seems to be very comfortable for people because they can give all sorts of promises for 30 years or 50 years. And I think most of them have no intention whatsoever of fulfilling them. Yeah. Maybe some people are genuine about that, but I don't think so. Whereas if we said, right, we within two years, we're going to stop all logging in the Amazon. Yeah, that'd be more useful. Be I think that could be done. You know, um, if there was a will. Yeah. Grow hemp. Yeah, and grow hemp. Yeah, Just exactly. Grow hemp. Yeah, yeah. Everything that's currently made out of wood can be made out of hemp. Yeah. yeah. And all, a lot of stuff that's currently made out of aluminium can be made out of hemp. 
Yeah. And a lot of stuff that's currently made out of plastic can be made out of hemp. It's easy to grow as well, isn't it, I think? Very easy to grow. Mm. Yeah. That's all you need to do. But we've got all this confusion in people's mind between uh, hemp and cannabis, although they're totally, yeah, different, yeah, yeah. totally different things. Um, and, oh, no, you can't grow hemp, they'll smoke it. I mean, it's such nonsense. Yeah, yeah. It's such I mean, is that, is that still the general view? I don't know. I'm a bit out of touch with that because, I mean, it seems so ridiculous that I'm amazed it still is a, a view. Oh, I don't know. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. I really don't. But uh, it seems to be the only excuse they've got for not growing it. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. legal to grow it. It's mad. Mad. Absolute craziness. Mm. Um, yeah. So you used to do what I'm doing now, didn't you? You used to be a yeah. podcast host. Yeah. Yes, I did. Not not visually, but I did it. Uh, yeah, on uh, audio. Audio, yeah, yeah. And you had some very interesting people on. That's some amazing, people. amazing people. Yeah. I mean, I felt a real privilege to to speak to them. You know, it was it was like. I mean that in a way that was the biggest joy of it, it was just a, just a, thinking wow I'm speaking to well you mentioned earlier Desmond Tutu or Gabriel Roth or you know I don't know Baron Kato whoever it happens to be all these people <laughs> Muji I don't know you know and it's just like wow how did you get them on yeah I don't know bribe them <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Desmond Tutu, or Archbishop Desmond Tutu, I should say. Um, I mean, it wasn't the best interview, by the way. I think it's one of our less good ones, but it was to some extent because I was just utterly awestruck that I was speaking to a living legend at the time, you know, who's an yeah. absolute hero, really. Um, that one was through, I just sort of followed these sort of threads. I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, and it just happened. Um, yeah, I mean, he was definitely the most, um, yeah, biggest luminary of the lot, really. I mean, he was remarkable. I mean, he, we all know him, incredible man. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so so much I would like to have asked him. Um, but he, he, we just had a nice conversation, but I wouldn't say it was the best interview. Of, of the ones we did. Yeah, but we spoke to so many interesting people. So uh, tips, as a podcast host, how can I get people like that on my show? <laughs> well, I, I don't know how we did it. I, uh, we, it was through a friend of mine, it's Merlin's Diary. He, he runs this thing called Merlin's Diary. I, I think he's still got the thing up and that was like a website where people could put, put um, their workshops and things, you know, and, and so on. And so we had that as a sort of credibility thing behind us. Um, and then, of course, the more people you get like that, the more easy it is to get people like that. Mm -hmm. And we had a certain amount of clicks, you know, um, visits. So it's one of these things, isn't it? The more you have, you know, it's a very um, abundance type thing. The more you have, the more you, more you, you get, if you know what I mean. You know, so uh, and maybe it was the time as well, because I know more people are doing podcasts now. And, at the, you know, this was... 10 years ago, so there's still plenty, but definitely fewer. How long were you doing it for, Neil? Uh, I think it was about three or four years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did, did one a month. Yeah, but it might even have been a bit more than that. I mean, if, if you look on that page, I can't even remember all the people we talk, talked to, but there were just so many interesting people. Satish Kumar, I remember, or Brandon Bays we did. Um, just lots and lots of interesting people. Yeah, yeah, would, yeah, three or four years, I think. Would you do it again? Actually, I'd love to do it again. Yeah, I would. I um, it's more my having so many different things going on that I find it. You know, you have to focus, don't you, a bit. So it's it's just getting it together. But yes, I like I like chatting. To, I mean, it's great, isn't it? I mean, I don't know. I assume you enjoy it, chatting to interesting people. Yeah. I mean, there are always exceptions that break the rule, of course. But <laughs> 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 um, and. Uh, and, you know, just, I don't know, it's just really great. And it's a great way of connecting. And it's a great way of other people sort of coming together too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you get into writing these books? And why did you decide to do it? Yeah, well, I think always I'd wanted to write, um, you know, books. And 
I think I lacked confidence with it. And, you know, just, you know, sometimes when you're um, brought up in certain ways, I guess you just don't think certain things are possible. So the idea of writing books to me seemed like an impossible idea. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually I thought, you know, really what I thought was I'm gonna, just going to get on with it. Well, the first thing I got on with was the journalism. You know, I just thought, well, look, you know, you can make a living out of writing. And then I did. And, uh, you know, still, well, in a small way at the moment, because I've moved more into the books. And then I, I uh, well, I had a book waiting, that The Flower in the Desert, that first one, had been sort of hovering around in my being for a long time. And mm -hmm. in, uh, well, quite a long, long time ago now, I, I decided uh, with my ex-partner to walk the Camino in uh, Spain. And I was, uh, somehow or other, that book, um, I wrote in the afternoons, you know, you walk in the mornings. And so that book sort of came out from the Camino experience in a way, although it was not remotely about the Camino. Mm. It was something prior to that, but it had that, it had, it has that sort of um, meditative pace around it. You know, you're sort of working deeper and deeper into your own being. Um, and there's that sort of mystery that you can't express. You can only express through you know, pointing, but you can't, you, mm -hmm. you can't express the mystery. It's in, in, inexpressible. Um, so you can point at it, but, you know, you can look at the finger or you can, or you can dive into the middle. And that book in a way was that sort of sense of unknown, unknownness. Mm. Mm. Is, it fair, is it fair to say that your books tend to be inspirational books? Well, I'd really like to think so. I think the theme and the, I've read that authors have tend to have a theme that they come back to again and again and again. And I would say my theme is um, a movement from sort of um, pain or whatever the alchemical base matter into the into trans trans transformation. Mm -hmm. And I th and I think so. People who have been through stuff and feel that. Um, internally know that there's something that they can that can grow from this and that then it appeals and there's a sort of universal appeal there because we all have painful experiences yes. and we all um we all want to work with them and i th and we all want to um transform them you mm. know i mean that is the endless um challenge of our lives mm. you know not to not to get brought down by it but to allow it to open us so what's the theme of Flower in the Desert? Um, well, it's, that's a very simple book, short book. Um, and the theme, well, it is that, and it's this movement into, this, into, the, into the middle of the desert. I don't really want to give too much away because it'd give the whole thing away. <laughs> <laughs> buy, buy the book, buy the book. Yeah, buy the book or, um, or uh, listen to the audio book as well. Um, but I, well, I mean, it, it is essentially a flower in the desert and what happens and how that... It, but of course, it's an allegory. Yeah. So it's about it's about the it's about uh, it's about whatever it means to you. To be honest, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like I mean, this is something I found really interesting with that. That I wrote it. Um, I think anything we do, anything creative we do, comes through us. Really, we're just the sort of filter. So it's our our way, but it's it's not me. It didn't start in me, and and then you give it. And then it means something to other people, but it doesn't necessarily mean what it mean, meant to me. And, mm. and that's really amazing in a way. Because, you you know, you could say it's like planting a seed, isn't it? You're, you're planting a seed or you're going out into your garden, you're planting your flowers in the, in the in spring or whatever it is. And then they come up and it's not me who does that. And it's, it's, it's something extraordinary about that. What other titles have you written? Yeah, well, I thought you'd ask me that, and I'm trying to remember. Uh, <laughs> my, for my child was one, which is a, is probably the the hardest read because that's a lot about. Um, it was done a lot when I was splitting up with my long term ex. It had a lot of about sort of the abuse stuff, and it was trying to find beauty and all of that. Yeah. And so it was a the, the movement of the ocean is another one. Um, my death and other dreams of life. Uh, there's uh, what have I got recently? There's 
I'm trying to think what they are now. They're probably written down. You've probably got them written there. And I have a, there's a couple more anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, They'll all be down in the description. Under they're, the all, they're all in uh, flowerinthedesert.co.uk or on Amazon. Um, but yeah, they're there. And uh, yeah, there's two more waiting in the wings. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'd love, you know, I mean, the main thing, I mean, they're very, actually, they're, uh, some of them are just Kindle at the moment, but they're very much, um, you know, priced at a, at a very affordable price point. And, you know, it's just lovely if people read them. <coughs> yeah, well, I always put my books up at the cheapest I can, because I, I also use Amazon, although it, 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 it sticks in the throat a little bit, I mean, yeah. to use Amazon, but that's where the people are. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, we are in that weird thing, aren't we? You know, you know, it's a sort of evil empire. And at the same time, you know, what do you do? If you want to reach the people, if you want to get your message out, yeah. you, have, you have to use organisations such as Amazon, even although it's, uh, it goes against, the, um, goes against the grain a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I feel the same. I mean, I think if I was more of a purist, you know, more of a, you know, full on, <clears throat> so I'd be, um, you know, then, then I wouldn't, but I'm just not like that. I mean, I admire people who are that principled. Mm. My principles aren't quite, quite as, quite as, uh, um, whatever, ordered as that. Just got a okay. cough for some reason. Well, my two books are both on Amazon, so I can't say anything. <laughs> no. Um, you know, Rupert Murdoch's Hitman, although that's a very old book now, and it's, it doesn't sell now very much. It's so, it's so, so out of date. Right. Um, my more recent one, Love Not Fear, yeah. um, you can get those on um, Kindle or on paperback through Amazon and, and elsewhere, but mostly through those two, two channels. Um, it's the only way to reach the people. I think so, yeah. I mean, it, it's, you, you know, you don't want to cut your nose off to spite your face, do you, really? And in the end, um, hopefully they, you know, hopefully Amazon is not going to be... <coughs> The um, you know, hopefully we can, we can do from the grassroots up, and if people are buying and reading and and opening and stuff, then things like Amazon ultimately will, I hope, become more benign. Mm. You know, right? You know, at the moment we're still we're still in an old sort of way of you know global capitalism and all the rest of it. You know, it's very um, it's it's not a benign capitalism, is it? At the moment, it's still it's still the old school stuff, really. Well, my book is very much about how we can find a third way. Yeah. Um, lots of people think the only alternative to capitalism is communism or socialism. And I'm saying it isn't. There's a third way. Yeah. The thing I talk about, which is a free gift economy. Right. OK. Um, and I, I know it's a long way down the, down the road, but I think ultimately we, we have to move to a free gift economy where we... Um, we give and do not count the cost, where we toil and do not ask for any reward. Yeah. Um, and I, my message that I keep pumping out through this show and my Monday show and the book um, is that we can form small groups now and start interacting that way now within the group. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a long time before it can become part of the macro economy, but we can make a start. Yes, and I think, you know, I think, I think though it's very easy to be despairing about, about the world, and there is a lot, you know, that, to despair about, there is also, in a much more invisible way, a huge amount of initiatives going on that are for the positive. Mm. I think it's really sometimes really hard to 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 have faith in that because at the moment it thinks well they're not making bugger all difference to anything but that I th they are I mean it's 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 a network of of these little communities doing different things or, or organisations or businesses or just individuals mm. and these you know it is growing um, and if I have hope in things it is that that this is becoming more and more joined up. And, you know, it's like an invisible, it's like the, whatever that stuff is under the soil, you know, that makes the soil really, um, it's, it's a bit like it's joining up, joining up. And I just hope, and I, you know, that there's some realism in here, but I just hope that that 
erupts into into something much more wonderful you know yeah i mean i keep saying that if only we can make a, a switch in our heads um from how much can i get to how much can i give yeah you know that's a, and also i mean yeah definitely um all the mean if we could if we did that we could move away from fear and meanness and move towards love and generosity and it involves trust this is the thing isn't it and we've been taught you know really that you know we have to go against our whole conditioning <coughs> and that's hard but i think it, it, is, hard, is, yeah. you know, it, it it is a risk but it is you know what what other choice is there i mean at the moment we're we're obviously you know, clearly we're we're um, up against a more and more controlling uh, system. You know, um, either by by design or by whatever. But it, it with the sort of technological revolution and all that, we without doubt are in danger of becoming a totally controlled society. Mm. You know, the, pretty much everything we do is monitored, and you know, so on and so forth. That's not what I would want. You know, but to step into the other thing and to change that, well, I don't know. I don't, you know, you just have to hope there's some sort of um, critical mass of, of people who will who will somehow allow that to change. Yeah, I think it's it, I think it's inevitable, Neil, that it will happen. It's just some crazy case of how long. Um, I mean, even my most recent book, Love Not Fear, is what five years old now. It was written before the nonsense of the last two years. And I thought we had 30, 35 years to bring this about. Right. And the last couple of years was a big wake up call for me. And I'm realizing that uh, we've got a much shorter time scale to, to accomplish this in. Yeah, I'm always a bit, um, I mean, I, I think you're probably right, but it's this putting dates on things it's tricky. I mean, there was a year when I, I worked for Greenpeace for a year and, uh, you know, there was always these sort of dates, like, I mean, not not that I can remember exactly what they came up with, but people are always saying, you know, by the year 2000 or by whatever. But of course, the dates are, it's not like there's a specific date, is there? I mean, it's like, mm. um, you can't say by 2030, if we haven't done X, Y and Z, then we're completely fucked you can't really say that because it's no. not a specific date it's mm. historically it would be very obvious if we were if we were like 100 years 300 years hence then we'd be looking at this period and it'd probably be over a century mm. that everything went tits up if that is what's going to happen or everything went remarkably into some new eden but we wouldn't be looking at a day or a year yeah. so, you know we'd be looking over a, over a period and 100 years is nothing in yeah. In, in the historical terms. I mean, my original reasoning was that we've got X number of years to teach our children. Yeah. And then they've got X number of years to teach their children, and then it can happen. And uh, I, I now think we don't have that long. Well, I always think also, I mean, I, I think, it, you know, obviously children, I mean, I think this present generation coming up, my daughter's uh, 22, I think that age group and the ones I know are extremely aware. I went to the youth rally in London a few years ago, for example, I thought it was so impressive. And I've been to a lot of demos in the over the years and so many of these days, but it goes yeah, some. Me too, yeah. yeah, but I, I mean, that uh, you really thought, wow, they're on it. So, you know, for them, this is they're on the cliff face, you know, they're on the top of the cliff, aren't they? They either get it together or they don't. And so but I, I, I've always had a problem with this pushing things onto kids. It's not up to the kids, it's up to us. If it's always the kids, then it's like, um, it's like it's never here, is it? Of course it's important, but what's really important that we do something? And yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I don't necessarily mean individually, although obviously we can do little bits individually, but, but I'm a, actually, the right person can change the world, can't they? Yeah, I mean, my reasoning is that we were born into a game we did not devise. Yeah. Based on a web of lies that we've been told since Babylonian times or Sumerian times. It's a long, long story. Mm. Uh, you and I, Neil, were born into that game. Yeah. And we find it very hard to see beyond it, although we're starting to. Um, the children that are born now, if they're taught by us 
that what you're being told at school isn't necessarily true. Yeah. Start thinking for yourselves. Yes. And, and they can maybe half break out of it. Yes. And then their children will have, maybe have a chance of completely breaking out of it. Yeah. It's this, um, this big illusion that, um, that we're born into. We, we, the world is totally different than we've been taught. Yes. I mean, that, I agree, it's like the veil's falling, isn't it? But on the other hand, we must be very careful, in my view, not to start believing some other dogma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, because it's, yeah. it's quite often it's people jumping from one dogma to another dogma. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't know how, how we got, how we keep things fluid, alive and working for the, for the good and, and realising that not everything that exists in the mainstream is bad. Not everything that exists in sort of the alternative or whatever you want to call it is good. Mm. You know, it's it, not, not everybody who believes in a better world um, is wholly good. We all have our shadows. We're all mm. oh, got our, our um, points where we don't see stuff. We've all got, you know, and we have to recognise that because just to push, you know, like, I don't know, satanic things on everybody else and not, you know, it's to me that's, it's worrying because it creates a schism. Yes. Yeah. We don't want a schism. It's no, you know, that's no good. It's about it's about creating something together. Absolutely. The whole game we need not devise is based on divide and conquer. Yeah, exactly. And I think people are falling into that. And quite a lot of us have been. Um, I mean, you know, the information we see online, and I think I personally, I'm a fan of online. But the information we see there, we can't know where that comes from in the main. No. So much disinformation. A lot of it purposeful. Um, and ultimately, just going by your gut, in a way, is okay, but even that doesn't, I mean, you know, it, it, in a sense, it's not enough, it needs testing. Absolutely. Don't, never, don't believe anything. What was it Buddha said? Um, don't believe anything, even if I told you. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Unless it resonates with your own, I can't remember yeah. word for word, but that's a no. different, yeah. Um, and I say the same in my book. I say, don't take my word for it. Don't believe it just because I've said it. Mm. Do your own research. I mean, one thing that I'm always really aware of is whatever group that I'm sort of peripherally involved with, um, and I've been loose group, there are unwritten rules. You know, it's, it, I find it absolutely sort of um, just noticeable that you have to behave in certain ways to be accepted by certain groups. And we all want to feel part of community. <laughs> The problem is that they preclude difference. So even if you join the most out there, you know, festival group or something, mm. if you happen to then think something a bit different to that group, you're not part of the group. And that's the same if you're part of the Tory party or whatever. You're just, you're just, and, and those invisible restrictions, I think we really need to be aware of. Yeah, it brings us back to climate change, doesn't it? It's one of the main things that you can't be a member of this alternative group if you don't believe in climate change. Well, I'm not sure that's not changing actually, but it's yeah, but it's right. I mean, I've, I I remember I can remember all sorts of things where people have said something in a in a in a group or in a meeting or just an informal thing, and you know they you know immediately there you can feel oh, no, that's not okay, and uh, I just think we've got to somehow. Um, I mean, I learn some sort of acceptance, but it's so difficult, isn't it? Because it's acceptance, and at the same time, you can't just allow everybody to do whatever they do if it's completely out of order. I mean, if they're racist or whatever, you know, you can't just say, "Oh, I accept that." Well, I don't. But you know, you, you, you. On the other hand, somehow you've got to allow. Somehow there's got to be a structure in ourselves, at least, that allows. Fluidity. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure quite what I'm saying, but I, you know, I know, I know the core of it. <laughs> yeah. I just want to see that those sorts of group decisions made as locally as possible. Yeah. Not made nationally or internationally or globally. Yeah. The whole one size fits all ideas don't work because no. one size does not fit all. No. Um, so if each group can have a, a committee or just get together once a week or once a month 
and, and, and just decide to, as a group what they're going to do I and how they're going to interact with each other. I think there has to be a core central vision because we have to be working towards the same things, even if we're localised. So mm. if the vision is, you know, environmental, um, you know, nurturing the environment, if it's, if it's looking after each other, if it's providing services that, that are needed, if it's a sort of compassionate, uh, caring sort of vision, great. But if you just have local groups without an overriding vision that, 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 that holds the, the groups together, then you're just going to get fract fractures, fractions and stuff, and you're going to get some that I would not agree with. I can imagine being in groups that are, you know, that I'm the, the, the only one who has that view. Well, it does happen. I mean, I helped to start a community garden here in Stafford, where I live. And I left it last week. I resigned because um, of all the infighting. Yeah. So it, it does happen. Yeah. Um, it's not easy. No one says it's going to be easy. Um, somebody else said, well, it wasn't there one person in charge. And I said, no, we di didn't want that. Yeah. Uh, by not having that, it all fell apart. So I don't know what the answer is. No, I mean, that's the trouble. I don't, I don't either. Therein lies an issue, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we're, we're running short of time. Right. Can you talk just a little bit about this group that you'll set up in yes. Hastings? Yes, I mean, I'm, I guess I've facilitated it rather than set it up, but I just came down to Hastings. Um, I, after splitting up my ex and all that, I, I, I could afford to buy here, so I bought it. And I, um, and I, I um, so Hastings is like a sort of, um, It was a different community to one I was used to, and and I I was very used to sort of more sort of, I mean I don't really like the word alternative, but people are involved in sort of um, various, um, you know, healing type modalities or just just the sort of thing we're talking about. People who care, you know, caring people. So I just thought I'd set up this 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 page where people could just put put information, talk, and and communicate. And now when because that's you know got to a reasonable amount of people every every month i just have a meet up or a, put on a little event and and the whole ethos i mean it's quite a modest thing really but it's just the idea is to try and build that sort of mass it's just really what exactly what we're talking about create community yeah, yeah. I, I used to know i used to know that area quite well i used to live in Udemore. okay oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on the way to rye yeah um so yeah, I, I do love that area. Yeah. Although I moved away from it ooh, fifteen years ago now. Yeah. No, I'm not it. always. I'm not always here. Instead, I'm quite. You know, but it's. Um, you know, I am here a bit anyway. <laughs> enough to. The, yeah, it's a good area, and it's got a lot of very interesting people. Um, it's more. Um, and it's got. It's got. Still got a social life here, which involves what I was doing when I was 18, which is like getting pissed and, and going to bed. <laughs> which, when I got here for a while, I thought, great, yeah, this is okay. But actually it's not what I want to be doing. I would much rather be doing sort of more, more um, sort of, uh, I mean, I don't mind doing it occasionally, but it's, I mean, I don't get pissed anymore really, but I, but you know, you go out for a few beers or whatever, great. But really I'd rather, rather do things that are more nurturing. Yeah, me too. I, I can't take my beer anymore. Not, not, <laughs> not, not, not large amounts of it anyway. No, I seem to have lost the will. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, oddly, uh, the, all these lockdowns did it for me because I don't, I'm not, I, I, li I live, live on my own and I, I'm just not a solitary drinker. So I'm pretty much not drinking on the head. So I did the opposite to what a lot of people did. And uh, so I haven't really got back into any sort of, you know, I, a serious drinker would be ridiculous. I'm not a serious drinker anyway, but you know what I mean. You know, that sort of social life is not really where I'm at. Um, so if people want to work with you on your journeying, how do they get in touch with you? I will put the links below. Yes. Just, uh, uh, well, there is, a, there, is my, there is my website, which is uh, neildelstrother.co.uk, I think it is. And that's got everything underneath it. I mean, obviously, the spelling's a bit tricky. But if they go to the flowerinthedesert.co.uk, then obviously you can see my name and then find that. Uh, actually, thinking about it, there is a website called journeyhealing.com, I think it is, which is uh, which is one that, that talks about that. It needs a bit of a revamp, to be honest. But 
people are very welcome to email me and then if they want to have a 15 minute talk i'm not there's no obligation to do anything i'm happy to do that um and see whether it helps them or not if you know if it could work for them or not um yeah, I mean, I'm really not about pushing things on people. In fact, I think I'm a bit too reticent in my marketing. I should, I definitely need to just step it up a bit. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and and also, by the way, there are different journey practitioners, and everyone has a different way of being. And I'd say I'm quite um, feet on the ground, not really so um, esoteric. You know, I'm about just let's get in there and let's go for it, and let's just you know let go to this process and and, and work with the stuff. So it's quite. You know, there are, if, if people are looking for a more sort of esoteric approach, there are people who do that too. That's brilliant, Neil. Thank you. I, as I say, I will put all the links below in the yeah. uh, in the description. Yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you. Yeah, really good speaking to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody else wants to come on this show in a future on a future Friday, uh, please do get in touch. I've got a few spots still vacant. So I'm sure there will be people on my community who would like to. Well, I said my community, the Hastings community, I should say. It's not mine. Um, but yeah, on that, maybe I'll put something there if you like. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, um, thank you for coming on. Namaste. Yeah, yeah, really lovely to meet you. And all the best, all power.